We recently discussed the history and performance of our newly purchased quad-core Zhao Shen ZXC X86 64 processor that was brought to us by a mix of VIA, S3 Graphics, the Shanghai Municipal Government, and Centaur. The ZXC Plus is a BGA CPU that can't be bought on its own, and it can't be socketed. So we needed a whole system for this piece. And now it's time to review the standalone computer. This is the Qinghua Tonefan TZ561-V3, a complete system that we think is designed to be sold to the Chinese government, which has mandated that it move away from all external CPUs for any of its internal affairs. Note again that users can still build with AMD and Intel in China, but that government offices are supposed to make a move away from them. Today, we'll be evaluating the entire system value, the build quality, and the performance of this $1,000 computer that contains a CPU with Atom level performance. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermaltake's Tough RAM RGB memory, available from 3000 megahertz up to 4400 megahertz in eight gigabyte by two configurations. The Thermaltake Tough RAM uses 10 addressable RGB LEDs for bright illumination and comes in both black and white kits of memory. Learn more at the link in the description below. If you want the whole history of the CPU, of the Zhaoshan CPU, and of what is happening in the world of uh, crossover between silicon, politics, economics, and social policy, then you can check our CPU review of the Zhaoshan ZXC Plus CPU. It's an interesting one. Uh, to quickly recap it for you, although you should go watch the whole piece, it's a deep dive into a lot of things. The quick recap is that, strictly from our standpoint of performance, it's probably closer to something like atom levels of processing power. It is not as good as a Sandy Bridge 2500K, in fact, very far from it. So the CPU has got a long way to go. There's another one that's out on market we've had trouble getting, but we're trying to. It's an eight core Zhaoshan CPU. And that one is supposed to be apparently closer to bulldozer type performance, but we're not sure because we don't have it yet. Anyway. We started out with our desire to just grab a homegrown Chinese CPU and test it and see how its performance was. And there are more options to choose from for that than you might think. In the world we all live in, in the enthusiast space, it's Intel and AMD, and that's really it. And that's the way it's been for a long time. Via is a name that many of you likely remember. Cyrix is another one. And both of those companies were relevant to the Zhaoshan CPU that we looked at. So uh, it's... Quite a history it's got, but as far as CPUs that support x86, there's only two. Even though there are a lot of Chinese homegrown CPUs, you've got your options between Haigon, which we think is the anglicized name, and Zhaoxin. So uh, Haigon is a company that licensed AMD's Zen 1 IP to produce processors, and we detailed that in part one of this series. It's more or less the same as first gen Ryzen and Epic, and it's also been more or less killed. At this point, it can't progress further because of legislation between the US government and China that have barred the use of that uh, or have, have explicitly ended that agreement. So we discussed that more there. But Level 1 Techs has also been publishing ongoing tests of these CPUs if you're curious for more data on Hygon. Uh, we went the opposite direction, where Level 1 Techs and Wendell, whom we respect greatly, have been working on the Hygon CPUs. We've been working with the Zhaoxin CPUs. And Zhaoxin is a company that was built on VIA and Centaur IP for, for several years, actually, to produce increasingly powerful laptop and desktop CPUs. This is the computer that we're working with today. It was about $1,017 for this system. So that's got the CPU in it. The computer is not made by the CPU maker, just like Intel and AMD don't make their full systems. The computer, rather, is made by Qinghua Tongfan, uh, and the older spelling was Qinghua Tongfan. So it's a, a pretty common company. THTF is the naming you'll likely see in the US. It's, they stick to an acronym. And it's a large company that sells many types of hardware and software globally. But for the US, it mostly sticks to TVs. So you may have seen them in Best Buy or something. Tong Fan's Chinese website is a little hard to navigate for an English speaker. But the system we have is the TZ561-V3. And it's the only normal desktop that we spotted with a Zhaoxin processor. Lenovo is also a major customer of Zhaoxin. And if you look at this, you could probably start to see some relationships. Anyone who's been in uh, maybe a school of any kind, your kid's elementary school, your high school, your college, has probably seen 
a front panel like this, except with red instead of blue. And there might be a reason for that connection to Lenovo's cases. But we're here to test the system as it's presented, and it's presented as THTF, even though it uses a case that looks eerily similar to ones that we've seen in school campuses across the country. So uh, current pricing, 71.99 yen, or approximately 1,017 USD. Uh, and again, that's about 71.99 RMB. So at the time of writing, it's expensive, plus cost of getting it to the US if you were to buy it. Just to get this out of the way first, we don't recommend actually buying it unless you're also a reviewer and you're doing something with it for content. Uh, it is not good value, but we're gonna talk about that today. Let's start with the benchmarks. So it did arrive. Upon unpacking the system, there was one glaring issue. The 220 volt power supply had no voltage switch for 115 volt operation. We were forced to take the system apart earlier than planned in order to connect a normal ATX power supply. And we ordered a different TFX PSU to install inside the system for thermal testing later on. If you watched our recent ATX 12VO piece, you probably heard the form factor TFX. That's what this is. And this is what came in it. Like stated, we don't have 220 volt outlets in our office. Could have taken it home, but then I'd have to unplug the dryer. So uh, we did buy another TFX power supply. They're pretty easy to find and they're not expensive. And they're basically made for systems exactly like this. Slim desktops that are typically in some kind of corporate, educational, or government deployment. Opening the system is pretty convenient given that it's a compact proprietary office computer. The top cover comes off and the optical drive and SSD flip up together like a cassette and a tape player, or like every school computer we've ever worked on repairing. Now, opening this does require breaking the warranty seal. Well, we're not really sure what it is. We don't know if this is a warranty seal or not, uh, because none of us can can don don wen zi soi tam de bao zhen. We can't read Chinese, so let's move on. Warranty seal broken, it's easy enough to get inside of. We'll talk more system internals after the benchmarks. With the power supply swapped and the system functional, we could swap out the stock Linux boot drive for a Windows 10 install and get some of our usual testing done. Now don't worry, we're gonna come back to that boot drive in a bit because it has a custom OS on it called NeoKylin. And there's a lot of misinformation about the various offshoots of that OS. And Patrick has gone through the painstaking measures to figure out what all of them are and spent a couple days on just writing that part of the, the research. Maybe we'll break that out into another video too. But it's got a special OS on it that we'll revisit, but we need Windows on there to do something familiar for the audience and for our own testing. So again, light CPU testing was in part one, including Blender. We had Civilization six turn times just for fun. We did some Cinebench stuff, some power consumption. But in part two, we're covering the whole system. So that includes a two gigabyte R7 430. It's an AMD GPU, it's quite old, and it wasn't high-end when it came out four years ago either. This was never meant to be a gaming PC, to be fair, to THTF, but it's still priced like one. And Ultimately, our testing options are limited because we mostly work on gaming systems. So we couldn't just run our normal CPU test bench and walk away like we might do otherwise. We can't run our normal GPU test bench. This thing had to be somewhat customized for the hardware that's in it because it's all so low end. The first test we tried was the Final Fantasy XIV Shadowbringers benchmark. Final Fantasy XIV is an MMO that launched in its current iteration in 2013. So the graphical requirements are fairly low, even for the recent Shadowbringers expansion. The game's minimum required AMD GPU is listed as an R7 260X, and the minimum CPU as a 2.4 gigahertz i5. Fortunately, we've got an R7 430 and two gigahertz ZXC plus quad core for the CPU. We ran the DX11 bench at 1920 by 1080 on the high preset, which was ambitious and scored 1,415 points. If you don't know what this means, the software tries to help out by informing us that it's low. Thanks, we had no idea. To clarify, what they really mean is unplayably low. It's a slideshow. Trying again with the lowest preset for desktops, standard, again at 1080p, we got a score of 2476 with an average frame rate of 16.68 FPS. To clarify, that's awfully close to the 60 FPS frame time division of 16.667 milliseconds and the unit we're using here is frame rate, not frame time. So again, that's 16.68 frames per second, not frames as in frame times. The reported minimum frame rate was three. Yeah, like the single digit 
that's reported via the benchmarks log file rather than our usual logging method because frankly more overhead seemed unfair, but we believe it based on the stuttering. You could almost sort of play this game at a resolution below 1080 if you didn't stare directly at particle effects too often. Total loading time for the five scenes was 55.2 seconds or 11 seconds on average. Not as bad as it could be, but this is off of an SSD. This benchmark is free to download if you'd like to play along at home and compare the points, but for now we can scratch Final Fantasy XIV off the list of playable games for this PC. Next up was the oldest game we still regularly test, GTA V. We ran one pass at 1080p with all settings at normal, after which the game refused to cooperate and launch in full screen mode again, but one was enough to get the picture. Average frame rate was a shockingly good-ish 34.8 FPS, but the 1% lows were 5.5 FPS and 0.1% lows were 2.4 FPS. We're talking frame times averaging 28.7 milliseconds at best, with some really long stutters to frame times at 416 milliseconds at worst. A few frames held for half a second, and that's a really long stutter. So to use a technical phrase, it, it, uh, it sucked. Constant texture popping and long painful hitches while flying made it hard to even watch. For what it's worth, GTA 5 warned us every time we launched the game that our hardware didn't meet the minimum specs, and we obviously knew that too, but it illustrates the point. This isn't a gaming PC. It is $1,000 though. Finally, we ran 3D Mark to at least get some number on the screen that we could compare to other hardware. The overall score for the standard 1080p Fire Strike test was 1232, with sub scores of 421, 2331, and 1472 for combined physics and graphics, respectively. That translates to a frame rate of 2 <laughs> during the combined test, 7.4 for physics, the CPU test, 7.3 for graphics 1, and 5.7 FPS for graphics 2. GT1 is more core intensive, GT2 is more memory intensive, so this makes sense. The CPU score was really dragging though. So you could build, obviously, a much better computer than this for $1,000, even if you're in China. Intel and AMD are still there. It's not like you can't buy them or you aren't supposed to buy them. The only difference is that within a couple years, the Chinese government wants to move away from them. But if you're an enthusiast, uh, you could still build with AMD or Intel CPUs. So there's really no value here in general. But that's not the long-term play. The long-term play for the, again, Shanghai-backed Zhao Xin is not to immediately or directly compete with AMD or Intel. It's so that uh, China can have its own CPU. And given that government money's behind it, given that there's a dubious history of intellectual property, there's a decent chance that the company making this CPU can catch up a whole lot faster than the trailblazers of AMD or Intel took to get to the point they are now. It's always easier when you're not first, unless you're a YouTube commenter, in which case there's probably several of you who said first already. But this is a matter of, well, Zhao Xin is already getting up to eight core parts that are supposed to be on parity with Bulldozer, and that's a pretty far jump from where this was. And this was one of the earlier generations, whereas there's some newer stuff for 2020 that we haven't been able to get yet, but we're trying. Uh, so you have to keep the, the scope of the project in mind, which is that there's a greater play here than competing now today. Uh, anyway, moving on to inside of the system next. In the process of replacing the power supply, having the case open gave us the opportunity to check out the rest of the internals earlier than planned. Even with the case as small as it is, there's still a surprising amount of empty space inside, especially since the hard drive bay was left empty. There's a single 256-gigabyte 4C brand SSD, which we've never heard of before this, and a CD, DVD, RW drive, both connected via SATA. Hardware Info 64 reports SATA 2 speeds at 3 gigabits per second, which lines up with the chipset's claimed specs. Memory is two sticks of ADATA 1600 megahertz CL11 DDR3 RAM. FSB speed is 1333 MHz. Bus speed is 333 MHz. CPU clocks can range from by 4 at 1.33 gigahertz to by 6 at 2 gigahertz. And RAM runs at a multiplier of 2.4 or 800 megahertz, but 1600 megahertz since it's DDR. The GPU is connected to a full length PCIe slot. There's also one PCIe by one and one PCI slot that are available on the board uh, for older devices. Graphics is handled by the previously mentioned R7 430, but this motherboard is equipped with an unused, in this case, integrated graphics chip, courtesy of its namesake. 
the VIA VX11 PH chipset. Yes, that same VIA. The chip holds basically everything except the CPU cores. The memory controller is the most noteworthy, and that's a part that moved to the CPU years ago for Intel and AMD, like more than a decade ago. It supports two slots max, it's single channel. The chipset also hosts I.O., only two SATA 2 ports supported, but three USB 3. It hosts PCI and PCIe connections, six lanes max, max configuration by four, and an IGP, which is a VIA C640-645. The die and the package for the chipset are both significantly larger than the actual CPU, although the TDP is only 8.8 .8 watts compared to the CPU's 18 watts. So it only gets a passive aluminum heatsink for the chipset rather than the CPU's tiny heatsink fan combo. We don't have much faith in TDP as a means of measurement from any company, but hopefully Zhao Xin's numbers are at least internally consistent. Both the chipset and the CPU are BGA soldered directly to the board, and neither have an IHS, putting bare silicon in contact with their heat sinks. There's a single ethernet port for internet connectivity handled by a gigabit Realtek chip and we were able to pull down files from our server at the usual 111 megabytes per second speed that we get from gigabit cards. Note that THTF has chosen a Taiwanese real tech part over an Intel part, which is the common choice on a lot of enthusiast-grade motherboards. The C640 and 645, also known as the Chrome line of S3 GPUs, developed by S3 Graphics, that's another old name, uh, was made while they were owned by VIA prior to their sale in 2011 which we talked about briefly in part one. A search of the Microsoft Update catalog, something that we do in our free time for fun, implies that these GPUs were released sometime in 2012, after S3's sale to HTC. The 640 and 645 aren't really differentiated. The C640 or 645 is how they're collectively identified everywhere. 640 slash 645 including in CPU-Z. The IGP in our system is fully functional, but THTF evidently decided that an eight-year-old GPU that hasn't had any Windows updates for drivers since 2015 wasn't up to snuff, despite using its own OS. We bring the GPU up specifically because there's some uncertainty as to whether Zhao Xin is still using S3's Chrome-based IGPs. Some newer ZXC and ZXC Plus boards use the Jiaoxin developed ZX100S chipset as an alternative to VIA's VX11PH, which does have some legitimate upgrades like additional PCIe lanes and dual channel memory support. But the IGP may be the same. The model isn't listed. It seems likely that Zhao Xin would continue to use or at least iterate on the C645 rather than starting from scratch, especially if VIA still has the rights to the S3 GPU IP developed under them. Either way, the chipset in this system is openly made by VIA and S3, and the discrete GPU is made by AMD. So this system isn't as close to 100% Chinese as Zhao Xin's more recent SOC offerings. The cooling solution for the CPU is absolutely minimal. Just a tiny aluminum heatsink and fan that look like together they might barely cool an X570 chipset, which is nearly the same power consumption, by the way. We'll cover thermals more later, but for now, suffice to say that the heatsink barely gets warm even under 100% CPU load. We talked power consumption in the CPU review, but the entire system is under 50 watts total system power with a heavy CPU workload, so it's not much concern. The CPU fan is also the only fan other than the GPUs and the power supplies, the latter of which is solely responsible for exhausting air from the case, making the whole system nearly silent. It all goes through the power supply at some point. Seriously, even the CPU fan is inaudible with air conditioning running. The Apivia 300 watt supply we bought to replace the original Great Wall 200 watt supply generates most of the noise in the system, so we can't say what the actual noise of the original system would have been with complete fairness because we couldn't test that power supply. Under full CPU and GPU load, we measured it to be 36.2 dBA at 20 inch distance from the front, approximately where a user would be seated. With the tiny fans wearing away, it really wasn't that loud. At idle, the noise level is much the same, but again, the power supply is noisier than anything else. The 4-core ZXC Plus has an 18-watt TDP, as does VIA's CPU that it's based on, while the 8-core simply doubles this for a 35-watt TDP. We still say TDP is basically made up, but even so, this is an extremely low power part. Our power measurements barely registered the CPU on the ammeter, with power consumption up to about 0.7 amps on the 4-pin connector. The stock power supply was only 200 watts and lacked a 4-pin CPU power connector, 
So THTF simply split off the plus four pins from the ATX 20 plus four pin connector and rerouted them, which is more than enough in this instance. The dinky CPU heatsink keeps things reasonably cool even under full load, assuming VIA's per core thermal sensors are accurate. Using the Prime95 and Firmark workload we usually do as a torture test for PC cases, we measured an average CPU DT under load of 28.7 degrees Celsius over ambient. That translates to a raw temperature reading of about 50 degrees across all cores under 100% load with this heatsink. The GPU is just a regular old R7430 with a low profile design, so it didn't fare as well, but it still maintained an average of 52.1 degrees over ambient, which is fine. There are no case fans, but the TFX power supply exhausts the air as aggressively as it can, which seems intended given the fan orientation. There is ventilation at the front of the case with an optional fan mount as well as a vent on the side of the case that together offer all the air that this system ever needs for cooling itself. Overclocking, if we look in BIOS, is not possible, at least not on this system's BIOS. Options are limited to enabling or disabling ports, selecting the primary GPU, and other equally vanilla features. Luckily for us, anyway, UEFI boot is one of the options that's in here if you for some reason bought this and then wanted Windows. The BIOS does repeatedly refer to VIA and VIA features if any further confirmation was needed that ZXC is a thinly veiled VIA CPU. And again, part one for more detail on that. The BIOS is dated 2017, a year after the ZXC Plus's launch and right before the KX5000's end of year release. The full system that was shipped to us consists of a PC, monitor, keyboard, and mouse. All of these are standard office fare. The monitor is a THK23E81HG, a name which turns up absolutely no results on Google, yet still manages to keep the illegible monitor naming scheme. It measures 23.8 inches diagonally, it has VGA, DVI, DisplayPort, and HDMI inputs, no speakers, it runs at 60 Hz, 75 at some lower resolutions, and it supports 120 volt input without a special adapter. We're not monitor reviewers, and we don't want to be, but the display isn't pure garbage, and it isn't just a throwaway. The stand, however, is, but viewing angles are good and the bezels are narrow. This is one of the lightest, cheapest built monitors we've ever worked with, and it feels like it's barely held together physically, but the display itself is actually fine and we'll probably use it for thermal test benches. THTF manufactures its own displays, and in fact, they license the Westinghouse name to sell them in the US. The keyboard's model number is DK3590U, and the mouse is the DM3580U. The mouse is an extremely generic two-button optical design that wouldn't look out of place at any point in the past 20 years. The keyboard is a low-profile rubber dome design with a US layout and Chinese text on the back citing the usual FCC regulations and Microsoft's trademark for the Windows keys. This particular all-in-one system is only sold in China, but THTF evidently cares about being able to sell their peripherals in the US. Our sets changed, ignore that. As for who would pay $1,000 for a system that can barely run anything, it's probably the same answer for every country, and that's the government. This is where, just like part one, we have to issue a quick disclaimer. We're not here to provide any political commentary or social commentary on the situation, just the facts on how the technology is being handled by much larger political entities than uh, we could have any impact on. There's a distinct difference. We're only providing information here. This section will deep dive into China's upcoming alternatives to Windows and other traditional operating systems like the common Linux variants out there. The Chinese market is flooded with variations that are all mostly named Kylin that we're talking about today, but they're all variations of that naming. So it's very confusing to put it all together. And most of the entangled web of operating systems that we're referencing here have been in some form uh, improperly linked in other articles online. So we've tried to correct that as best we can. This should become a fairly complete source detailing the different Kylin distributions in at least their most basic elements of how they're marketed, what connections it has with the other ones, some of them are connected with Ubuntu, and so forth. As mentioned in part one, the Chinese government is planning to use homegrown Chinese technology to fully supplant US hardware and software in its government offices by 2022, not to be confused with the consumer market there, and it's for a variety of reasons. Again, politics isn't really our focus here. Most of the reasons relate to ongoing trade disputes between the two countries that we won't really get into because the US government has banned sales of certain products like Xeon CPUs intended for supercomputer use to the Chinese government by the US suppliers like Intel. 
This THTF office computer has minimal foreign involvement, ignoring the Texas origins of its CPU architecture, and it comes pre-installed with NeoKylin Linux despite being compatible with Windows. The vast majority of computers in THTF's China catalog come with normal Intel and AMD processors and normal Windows licenses. This one is specifically designed for, we think, the government market, where China's government agencies are forced to replace their foreign hardware at some point in the next few years. Kylin is an interesting subject in itself. The name is an anglicized version of Chilin. Kieran Beer and the unicorn from Monster Hunter are also named after the same animal. Kylin the OS is actually a group of different operating systems that are developed by the National University of Defense Technology. Predictably, this is a state-owned organization, and it's been developed since at least 2001. The first iteration was based on, and almost entirely identical to, OpenBSD, which is a Unix-like operating system. And from the beginning, all of the versions of Kylin have been intentionally skinned to look like Microsoft Windows, such that it would help aid workers in transitioning from Windows into the local made operating system because it minimizes the amount you'd have to learn. At some point, the OpenBSD-based operating system was abandoned and the Linux-based Kylin 3.0 was released. It's difficult to pinpoint the exact release date, but it must have been in or before 2009. In 2010, the NUDT partnered with China Standard Software, or CS2C, the makers of NeoShine Linux, to fork NeoKylin Linux, the distro which came with our desktop. At some point, development of the main NeoKylin Linux distro was handed over to Tianjin Kylin Information Technology Co. Limited, or TKC, and remains in development to this day, under the name of Inhe Qilin, a name that translates to Galaxy Kylin. This main branch is often referred to as plain old Kylin, in English at least, but the translation helps to avoid confusion. That's because there's a lot of others, like John Biao Qilin, which translates to winning bid Kylin, and is what English speakers typically call Neo Kylin. Neo Kylin is based on Red Hat Linux, so we assume Galaxy Kylin is as well. There's a widely cited report by the Wall Street Journal that we can't read because we refuse to make an account on a paywalled newspaper website, but it's also referenced elsewhere, and apparently that said that 40% of Dell PCs came with Neo Kylin installed. Installation on pre-built is a huge part of Neo Kylin's claimed success. We know this because CS2C bragged about the report on its own website. Note that this report specifically names Neo Kylin, not Galaxy Kylin or Ubuntu Kylin, which has confused some outlets, like The Verge. Our desktop came with Neo Kylin 7, the latest public version. Uh, Galaxy Kylin, by the way, is on version 10.0, and it's skinned to look like Windows 7, while we've seen older screenshots skinned to look like Vista or XP. The developers are fully open about their intention to make a Windows-like OS, Galaxy Kylin, for example, openly advertises this as a feature. We mentioned Ubuntu Kylin, or Yochilin, a minute ago. This is yet another separate distro that was launched in 2013 and has had updates as recently as October 2019. It's an official collaboration between the developers Canonical and the NUDT. This is perhaps the easiest of the Kylin operating systems to Google in the West, but it isn't Kylin or Neo Kylin. It's explicitly different. Ubuntu Kylin didn't fail. Ubuntu Kylin is not older than Neo Kylin, and Ubuntu Kylin is not the original OS named Kylin. If someone says all three of these things in one article, like perhaps The Verge and its 2017 expose on its own intelligence, they're wrong. Ubuntu Kylin is partnered with Galaxy Kylin and uses a version of their logo just to make things extra confusing. Versions of both Galaxy Kylin and Ubuntu Kylin are available to download from their respective websites if you're curious about them uh, and want to try it out yourself. As stated earlier, the Chinese government is trying to rid the government offices of foreign technology and software by 2022. The Kylin family has found itself in an extremely strong position since it's Chinese developed and advertises compatibility with Chinese built CPUs, not just the x86-64 Xin and Haigan chips, but also the Longxin uh, MIPS chip, the Feitong Spark chip, and the Quinpun ARM chip. In December of 2019, TKC and CS2C held a press conference to announce that together they were forming a new company, which translates to Kylin Software Co. Limited, to once again merge the two branches of Kylin into one as of yet unnamed domestic operating system, combining the strengths of Neo Kylin's hardware compatibility and Galaxy Kylin's mobile, server, and desktop variants.
it will probably have Kylan in the name as well. If you feel the need to research any of the saga on your own, we'll direct you to a ZDNet article that we can put on the screen. This is the single most coherent explanation that we've seen of this messy concoction so far. Some form of Kylan is also the current operating system, by the way, of the Chinese Tianhe 1A and Tianhe 2A supercomputers. Tianhe 2A was in the number four spot on the top 500 supercomputer list as of November 2019 and held the number one spot from 2013 to 2015. Top 500 and other sources cite the OS as simply Linux. Kylan. This is based on a 2013 report by Jack Dongera, compiler of the top 500 list. And based on Dongera's wording and the number of other top 500 supercomputers using RHEL or the RHEL based CentOS, we would logically assume that Tianhe 2A is running Galaxy Kylan. However, during a 2014 canonical keynote, founder Mark Shuttleworth presented a slide with the text, quote, world's fastest computer runs Ubuntu OpenStack with an Ubuntu Kylan logo on it. A slideshow from 2013 OpenStack Summit on the same subject uses the Neo Kylan logo with a cloud on every page. There is a Neo Kylan cloud OS, by the way. A blog post on the official Ubuntu website says Tianhe 2, the world's fastest supercomputer, runs on Ubuntu Kylan. And quote, NUDT designed and built Tianhe 2, which runs on its own Kylan cloud Linux operating system in the same article. Our best guess is that Galaxy Kylan runs Tianhe 2 and that Ubuntu Kylan can be run on Tianhe 2. We're not supercomputer experts or Linux experts, but this is kind of how we've been able to boil down the confusion. This is now doubly complicated by the fact that Tianhe 2A switched to homegrown Matrix 2000 128-core RISC accelerators in 2017 rather than the planned Intel Xeon 5s due to US embargoes on those parts. So TH2A runs, quote, a heterogeneous computing software stack. So after all of that, you might be wondering, OK, well, why? Uh, our experience with Neo Kylan was underwhelming. We spent a significant amount of time trying to figure out just how to switch the locale to ENUS. And we also tried to uh, get basic things installed like Steam, for example. We couldn't get the RHEL or the CentOS versions of Steam working, which limited our options as a gaming-focused website, at least as of now. There are a couple of pre-installed games, for example, Solitaire, Chess, and one that's uh, called Mines. We're not sure what that is yet. But there's nothing unique. Other than that, this is just an, a Linux distro that's trying to look comfortingly like Windows 7. And it's by its own admission that it's doing that. For productivity, the WPS and Foxit office suites are installed. So you've got something basic there. Under appearance options, there's also a classic mode, which brings back the previously publicized XP skin from the older Neo Kylan releases. As far as the computer then, because the CPU is not socketable, you can only buy it with the system or with a motherboard in the least, there's absolutely no reason anyone should buy this computer for personal use especially in the West, where you've got plenty of options for even lower prices. But even in China, it's overpriced at $1,000. It just it doesn't make sense for personal use, for non-government office or work use. It's just the only reason this really exists, as far as we can tell, is to target the government offices where they're being forced to switch off of external hardware and software at some point. Uh, so specs-wise, this is massively overpriced. Zhaoxing's CPUs are becoming promising. The newer ones that we don't have yet, like the 8-core, are competitive with older AMD bulldozer chips, which, at least as far as we understand now, which, uh, although they were a bit of a joke and a meme in this community, that's a big jump. So the older ZXC Plus is a rehash of a lower power via CPU in the vein of an Intel Atom. And everything else in the system is built around that. The chipset handles a ton of the computer's functionality it's old, it's outdated. The memory controller isn't even on the CPU. Uh, the IGP lacks the performance or the driver support to the extent that THDF felt it necessary to install an R7430 in the system. And uh, the system is basically, it's a fun novelty to play with, but the idea of spending $1,000 on a system for, well, really any use that we can think of in, in our core use cases in our audience just makes it obviously not worth it. It's not even close. The best thing you get out of it is an OS that feels comfortingly similar to Windows 7. The peripherals are 
functional. They're very generic. There's nothing wrong with them really, but they're also not higher tier gaming peripherals. Monitor is actually surprisingly fine other than the stand being extremely cheap. The price then is just because of the no foreign tech policy that's being put in place by the government. There's one other PC in the same line as this one on THTF's website, and it comes equipped with a run-of-the-mill four-core, four-thread bulldozer chip that's an A10-8770 and NVIDIA's GT720 and also Windows 7 license, but it still only costs about $690, so significantly cheaper. Woefully outdated and overpriced, but that's a much better deal for the performance than this system is. And we'll keep an eye out for higher-end Jiaoxin-based systems in the future to see whether they start approaching Intel and AMD and price to performance. Uh, this is going to be an emerging battleground as things advance, and it'll be interesting, at least from a technology standpoint, to see how it develops. But uh, obviously, we wouldn't recommend buying this computer. It was interesting for a review, but that's about where we cap it. That's it for this one. Watch part one for more information on the history behind the CPU and why it exists and what's going to happen. And you can support us directly in this type of content by going to patreon.com slash gamersnexus or store.gamersnexus.net. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time.